Hi, you're on the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. I want to give you an education in reality. The article stems from an article at ChristianHeadlines.com. I think everybody on the planet, every English-speaking person probably on the planet, knows that the legendary Jeopardy host Alex Trebek died last Sunday at 80 years of age. This after a battle with cancer. I might add, it seemed like a very short battle. His life story was part of his appeal, however. His father was a hotel cook who emigrated to Canada from Ukraine. Trebek graduated from college with a philosophy degree and worked as a newscaster before beginning his career in game shows in 1973. In his autobiography, entitled The Answer Is, Reflections on My Life, Trebek stated his life's motto. He said it was, quote, a good education and a kind heart will serve you well throughout your entire life, end of quote. With all of this in mind, the author of this article on this website I mentioned to you, goes on to educate and to encourage us in this kindness. He points to the messages he believes God has for us today. The twin calls to a kind heart and the practical realization of our core commitment that all men are created equal. Words enshrined in our founding document. Words that have changed the world for good. Words men fought over and died for, both in our fight for independence from Great Britain and what we call our civil war, a war that was anything but civil, a war that saw the deaths of as many as 750,000 American soldiers, more than all other American war casualties combined to date. Our democracy was broken by the 1860 election because we rejected the five words that birthed our nation. All men are created equal. Presidential elections have been passionately contested since the first election in 1796. But each time our democracy has held the United States has fought 12 major wars across our history, but each time, with one exception, our democracy held. Where it did not hold was Vietnam. But Vietnam was never technically a war. America has survived pandemics, depressions, recessions, and yes, presidential assassinations. We have seen rioting in our streets and terror attacks on our cities, and yet each time our democracy held. The only exception was the 1860 election of Abraham Lincoln that led to a civil war. A war among civilians, Americans all. A war over America's founding creed that all men are created equal statement first proclaimed in the biblical declaration that God created mankind in his own image. Genesis 1 27. The South blamed the war on northern aggression and aggression against their rights. The North blamed the war on southern slavery and the stubbornness to not give it up. The two sides could not find a peaceful way to protect the equality of all people and our nation's bloodiest war was the result. You see, democracy works only as we continue to embrace our founding creed. It works because it gives every citizen the same vote as every other citizen. No matter your wealth, your race, your gender, your vote counts. It counts as much as that of the president or the president-elect or our wealthiest billionaires. As a result, Americans live in a country where 70 million people supported the incumbent president. But our nation will peacefully transfer power to his opponent if it proves 
to be a lawful vote. But even the ongoing legal challenges are the outcome of an expression of the rule of law based on the equality of all citizens. Whether your candidate won or lost, if we continue to believe that all men are created equal, America wins. These five words, changing the world, led to a second message, one directed to America's Christians, that we must work boldly and graciously for the equality and sanctity of life for all Americans. God calls his people to pray, to speak, to act. Life begins at conception, meaning that the pre-born are equal to all other Americans. And we must pray for our new leaders to protect them. We must speak up for the unborn. We must act on their behalf by caring for pregnant women and advocating for adoption. Why? Well, because life is sacred. It's sacred to God. It's sacred to us all. God is the one who gives life. God has the right to take it. And the only other person in this world who has that right receives it from a government who makes every effort to be sure it's necessary. Along with this is our religious liberty. Religious liberty is America's first freedom, preceding even the freedoms of speech, press, the assembly, and our First Amendment. Exercise your religious liberty by speaking up for religious liberty, and then by acting out, inviting all Americans to find true freedom in Christ. Because because our trust resides in Jesus alone, not in governments, not in people. People are fallible, often fickle. People can be evil. We must learn who it is we can trust. But with God, we know he is trustworthy. <clears throat> 6,000 years of human history has demonstrated that over and over again. The doubters, the disbelievers, they say they don't get it. I say they don't want it. They see only death and destruction, and they blame God for not preventing it. We, on the other hand, see the same death and destruction, and we thank God it wasn't worse. Knowing human behavior. Knowing that all of this flows out of the human heart. It does not flow from the heart of God. Knowing that natural disasters flow from a corrupted universe and that the universe is corrupted by sin. The scientists don't believe that. But the Bible teaches us that God is able to create an earth environment for us that will never end. That's after this world is destroyed. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and it will go on for eternity. It doesn't have to die. The Bible teaches us that it was sin that brought corruption on every level. None of this happened before the biblical flood, the first 2,000 years. Human beings lived to be hundreds of years old, over 600, 800 years of age, because their bodies were not corrupted by disease and deformity, because there were no plagues, no natural disasters, nothing to kill off entire populations. The Bible tells us it's sin, the sinful attitudes and behaviors that flow from a sinful heart these are they that bring death and destruction to our world. And the history of mankind bears it out. Why do we have the threat of this killer flu? Well, primarily because the world is morally corrupt. 
It is with certainty our government and the experts blame the Chinese for this pandemic. But also because the world is physically corrupt. It is spirally, spiraling downward in terms of health and disease. Each succeeding generation is weaker than the one before. We used to worry about pneumonia. We found a cure. Today we have more medicines than we even know about. And yet we are losing more and more people to disease. Add to this the careless attitudes and behaviors of a growing majority of people, people who actually believe they can live any way they please and they would still be healthy. People who believe they can ingest all sorts of chemicals and it won't impact their body negatively nor the bodies of their children. And yet these children proceed from these corrupted bodies. We now have generations of people who are susceptible to all sorts of disease, things that we never had before, and generations who are almost immune to the same diseases. Why? Well, they're probably just lucky. No, they have a stronger DNA. So that is just simply generational. But a lot of it is purposeful. Entire families that have not damaged their children's DNA and philosophy of life with drugs, alcohol, indiscriminating sex, destructive attitudes, and patterns of life. Patter ch parents who birth children that have a chance. We are all called by God to repent of our sinful, destructive ways. The way we think, the attitudes we have, the behaviors. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed us from sin. To believe that he came, that he was God in human likeness form. That he lived here. He went through the same kinds of things that we do. He suffered on a cruel cross until he died. And never once committed a sin, never once did anything to shame his father. As a human being, apparently it can be done. Redeemed means buying back. The result, result of his death and his burial and his resurrection made it possible for God to bring us back into the fold back as new creatures. The Bible calls salvation. When it takes place in a person, it creates a new creature from the inside, from the heart. We don't look any different. But we are now oriented toward what is godly, even if we don't know what it is. That's our commitment. We are a people of God. We are living out our lives in honor to him, whether it's our behaviors, our language, our values, our commitments, our goals, our purposes. Doing so in front of a dying world, living out testimonies that there is a better way to do this. I don't have to get down in the muck and the mud with you. I don't have to use gutter language I don't have to be sexual or overtly and mix company and tell these stories. I don't have to be all this nonsense. I can be something better. You and I are called to stand for truth with grace, to hold our leaders accountable with humility, and to treat those with whom we disagree with the respect that honors them as our fellow creatures, the way we would want to be honored. In a publication entitled, Before You Vote, Seven Questions Every Christian Should Ask, David Platt notes, Our trust resides in Jesus alone. He alone has no weakness. He alone is pure and holy. He alone has a monopoly on justice. No political candidate or party can remedy human depravity or change the human heart and no political candidate or party 
can provide for us, protect us, save us, or satisfy us. Jesus alone can do all of this. That's why our sole purpose is to have his approval, not the acceptance of the world, not the acceptance of our political party or political candidate, but God's approval. He therefore concludes, quote, as the church, we are not for Trump, nor are we for Biden, and we are not for anyone else. In any election, the church is not for a political party or a candidate. The church is for the Lord Jesus Christ. All our trust is in his word. All our allegiance is to his mission. All our hope is in his rule today, both in my heart and in this world, and his promise to return one day for those whose hearts belong only to him. Will you be for Jesus today? most important question you probably will ever answer.